So my name is Dave Eirig and uh, we're here today as an outreach for the artistic brain from UCI. The artistic brain is a theme of UCI's uh, UCI brain, which is an initiative that promotes interdisciplinary um, activity in the college. Um, what's exciting about the artistic brain is it's the only uh, brain initiatives, the only theme, we, UCI is the only institution to have an artistic theme devoted in our initiative. So it's kind of interesting. You don't hear a lot of you know, organized collaboration between scientists and artists. And a large part of the reason that we're here today is this gentleman over here who in 2017 agreed to collaborate with us in a science of acting class. It was the first time we ever did it. And um, what, we, what we did was we invited uh, fellows from the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory to come in and talk about things like cognitive linguistics. So what happens in the brain when we're speaking dialogue versus when we're speaking in real life? That's kind of an interesting thing to know as actors, right? How about emotion? Why do we have an emotional response to some things? And what happens in the brain? And most importantly, and this is the thing I least expected would be so important, is memory. The role of memory in our everyday behaviors. And so if you were to define the one job of an actor, I don't want to ask you to do it, I'll just tell you. I'll define it for you. It is to create behavior, isn't it? Right? Speaking words, reciting words is poetry. That's recitation, right? But acting is different. It's embodying behaviors. And there's a lot of things to think about when we do that. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a simpler way to do it? And uh, this gentleman here has helped us come to some really fascinating techniques, ideas, and concepts. And you ready for this? They've never been shared in public before today. This is the first time at this outreach program that we're going to share the memory work that was developed in this collaboration between the Claire Trevor School of the Arts and the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. And I'm excited about it because after the last couple of years, I put, this, put all the concepts together into a set of steps called the actor's algorithm. And I've written a book, and it's not published yet, but it's finished. And it's the result of um, this gentleman sitting down with me and telling me how memory works and then me coming in and saying, well, what if I do this? Yeah, well, that, that works and that doesn't. So um, I'm really excited to share these with you, the youngest generation of actors that I could think of, high school actors. You're mature enough to understand it. You get it, right? But you're the first generation. You're the first people ever to share it with. And it's great because uh, Dr. Murgaw has some lineage in the room. Phoebe is, uh, is uh, Dr. McGall's granddaughter, so even more meaningful and significant. Now, before I let uh, uh, introduce Dr. McGall and have him talk to you about the role of memory, let me tell you how significant it is to have him here today. And I think his story always is the easiest way to, to, to tell you how this, uh, to, to let you know what, what we have today. And that is, in 2018, Neuroscientists from all over the world, the top researchers from all over the world came to the first memory conference in Huntington Beach. So a couple of thousand researchers, and they all came to share their ideas. It was a phenomenal, incredible, creative scientific event. The very first speaker of the conference is not the spot you want to be in. Because in the first thing in the morning, nobody shows up to that one, right? Especially if you've got people coming from other countries. Well, Dr. McGaw was scheduled to be the first speaker in the morning. By the way, so, so you know, Dr. McGaw, started the very first department of neuroscience in the world at UCI. So I refer to him as the father of learning and memory. I don't know if that's fair, but I do it anyway. Um, and just to let you know how respected he is, at 8 in the morning when this gentleman got done talking, a full auditorium in Huntington Beach of the greatest researchers from all over the world, over a thousand people were standing up giving a, 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 an ovation to this gentleman. So that's how well-respected and well-revered he is in the world. He's contributed so much to science and to humanity, and now he's contributing to the arts in ways that I think are going to significantly change the way the entertainment industry creates new works in the future and maybe the way the actors are trained in the future. That's probably mine. <laughs> but that's okay. Okay. So, with no further ado, 
Uh, I would like to intro. So what we're going to let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about this new idea of it's, it's memory work for actors. So in order for you to understand why that's so important and how important memory work can be in your creative process, I would like to introduce the father of learning and memory, the author of dozens of books and hundreds of publications, Dr. James McGaw. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can only fail now. <laughs> Well, here's the, here's the thing. Um, I want you to think about it for a moment. That moment is gone. <laughs> now we've got a new moment. And our lives consist of a series of moments. And that's it. You feel that there's continuity. You think you're in a room and you understand that you're in a room and so on. But you do that because you put together minute moments of time and you glue them together so by the time I finish this sentence the first part of my sentence is already in memory. Isn't that interesting? The brain has this enormous capacity to create our own representations of the world. Remember we, we only live a microsecond at a time and it's gone now and now we're in a new one. And what gives the continuity, the glue in our brain that we call memory. And, and I have spent my life trying to figure out what goes on in the brain in order for that continuity to be created. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, we know a lot about it, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to, I want to direct your attention to uh, uh, what you do when you create a character. Now you, you yourself have zillions of these micro memories over your lifetime. You've created all of those. You've just, you're, they're there, you've created. And now you decide that you want to be a character. Well, what do you think? Don't you think that character has, has the opportunity, the obligation to have those series of, of experiences? You just can't move into a character and say, oh, I'm going to create a character now. Well, that character should be living, and that character should be created over billions of little micro-experiences over time. And your job as, as an actor, actress, is to figure out how to create that character which will represent what has been accumulated over that period of time. It's, it's not to imitate. It's not to fabricate. I'll get up there and pretend that I'm something else. In order to pretend it's something else, you have to know that something else. You have to know it. And so the first obligation of an actor or an actress with a part is to create that reality. What is, what is that exists that was created over time for this person? Just uh, uh, thinking of any character that you might be asked to uh, portray and think about how that person had a life and that person got to where he or she is now because of events in the past that created that. It isn't as though, it's not a cardboard thing. It's not just a car piece of cardboard standing up here and say, oh, I'm going to be like that. It's got to be rich, and it's got to be full of depth. Uh, so uh, let's suppose you want to portray the uh, General Lafayette in, in France. And you say, oh, that's interesting. You just have a guy with a funny hat on, and he, he's like this. Have you all seen pictures of Lafayette like that? And you say, oh, I'll, I'll figure out how to do that. No, you have to figure out what was this guy up to, and why was he up to it? What was the background that led him to do that? How, how did he decide that he was going to do the things that he did? What was the rationale for that? And you build, you try to crawl in to the life of that person. And if I were playing that role, I would create memories. I would create a life so that you don't have to say, I will pretend to do this. What you do just emerges from your understanding of who that character is. And all of that is based on memory. 
Now, if you've had uh, psychology or if you read psychology, you know that there are different forms of memory. There's not just a memory, but we have a very recent memory, so you can remember what you just did. Uh, we have long-term memories of several kinds of long-term memory. We have memories which are factual. Uh, you, who was the first president of the United States? How many of you know who that is? <laughs> How many of you remember when you learned it? No, you don't remember where you learned it because that's semantic, what we call semantic knowledge. That's just the factual information that, um, that are created. And uh, then we have episodic uh, memory. Do you remember the, uh, yeah, first time, the first day that you were on this campus? How many of you think you remember the first day you were on this campus? That's episodic memory, you see. And if you talk it about a lot, if you talked about that first day a lot, then it becomes se semantic memory. It moves from episodic, which is the remember of an event, into just knowledge that. So these are different kinds of memory, and they're represented in the brain in different ways, and so is the very recent memory that we have represented in the brain in a different way. And as an aside, I took it as my job uh, as a scientist to figure out how they all get together, but I'm not gonna tell you all about my science. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you about the nature of memory and the importance of memory for that. So, in developing a, a character, and I should tell you the truth in advertising, I started college as a drama major, so uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's not as though I have always been a scientist. I, I started off, and before I was in college, I was in lots of plays when I was young, and in junior high school and high school, and, and all of that, uh, and little, little theater and all of that, but then I became a, uh, a scientist. Now, developing a character, if I were developing a character, I would say, how can I create for this character not only the semantic knowledge, that is how to behave, the knowledge of to do this and to do that and, and what I'm supposed to, uh, supposed to know and so on as a character, but how, I, how can I create a life for this character? Well, what is the life of, of this character? Uh, what kind of experiences might have shaped this character to do the things that are required on the stage. And I would do a lot of thinking about that before I even, before I even memorized the line. You're assigned a character or you're, or you're lucky enough to get a character, then you build, frankly, an imaginary life for that character. But you build it partly on your own experiences and then partly on imagination of what those experiences would have been like for this particular character in this particular time. And if it's uh, something from another century, then you have to do some reading about that century. You have to learn what was happening, what was going on in that period of time. What were the polit political events? What were the social events? What were the economic events that were present at that particular time? If you're in a play uh, that, that's situated in uh, 1890 and you're a woman, wouldn't you like to know what the, what the status and, and the responsibilities of a woman was in 1890 as opposed to today? And you can't behave today and be successful if you're portraying somebody who was a woman in 1890 because the, the rules were different, the laws were different, the interactions were different. So that's, that's my overall all perspective on, on acting. You, you need to use our understanding of memory in order to create and behave as characters based on the creation of this appropriate memory given the circumstances, the time, and the history. And when Dr. McGaw said that uh, in our class a couple of years ago, I took it to heart and spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we create memories. And then I, he was kind enough to then in invite me into his, his office and I would run these ideas by him and we have come up with a specific technique, a way to use your imaginations to create the relevant, the relevant memories of your characters as they relate to your performance. And so that's what we're gonna learn today. Never before taught uh, to the, on the public stage before. But um, so that, that was a very good explanation. And it, what's important um, is to remember the difference between episodic memory, so events that have occurred, 
and semantic memory, which is stuff that we know, but we don't really necessarily know why we know it. We can count to 100, we can tie our shoes, those sort of things. We know, we know who the first president is, but we don't, we don't remember the time. It's not important. We can just recall that information, right? Does that make sense? Now, does anybody have any questions about memory before we create our first character's memory? For Dr. McGaugh, or, well, yeah, for Dr. McGaugh, for a minute. Okay, see, you're always so thorough. Oh, come it? on, speak up. Come on. <laughs> come on. Don't just sit there. <laughs> it was a, it was a, yes, yeah. Um, so what made you change from drama to science? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good story. Yeah, well, can, you that, tell her, can you tell her why you took the first class and the first class that you took? The first, which first class? The uh, learning and memory. Oh, oh, I, I, um, I was a drama major and I, uh, I took a psychology course and I had a, it had a, a chapter on learning and memory. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'll just read that chapter and then I'll know how to learn and remember for all of the parts that I'm going to be in. <laughs> and, uh, and then a funny thing happened. I got more and more interested in learning and memory and uh, I went down a different uh, pathway. But it really, uh, the beginning of my pathway was created because I thought that I'd read that book and then I'd learn how to memorize. <laughs> and then acting would be easier. Or that. I, didn't, I, didn't have, I didn't know what I, what I, know, uh, I know today. But I, I, I have to say, I moved on in, into science, but I, I never lost my, my interest in, uh, in drama. And, and I also studied music. Uh, and, also, and so my interest in, in uh, music and uh, drama remained and, and I, I shifted. I, I don't know if some of you know this, I played in a couple of jazz bands and I played in the Laguna concert band and so on. So I, I think I moved my artistic energy into music because it was scheduled and I wouldn't have to learn a lot of parts. <laughs> you never did learn to memorize those lines, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So, you guys are all working on a role today, right? So, if we were going to go through the whole steps, which we're not, because we're going to do today the four memories every character needs, okay? But if we were to do the whole thing, we would start out by looking at your script and identifying first, what are the words in your monologues or scenes that have a different meaning for your character than they do for you? That's how we start, because we're going to look to create the associations that the character has that you have. Okay? The second thing we do is we identify the semantic knowledge of your character. So what does your character know that you don't know? Right? And a lot of times it has to do with cultural. So again, if you have a character that you're playing in the in, in 1800s, um, if, if you have a scene in which you need to change a uh, horseshoe, right, then you have to learn to do that. Right? So what does your character know that you don't know how to do? They automatically, they don't have to think about how to change a horseshoe. It's just like tying their shoes, right? Does that make sense? Or even to know that there are horseshoes. Oh, no, there are. That's right. That's a bit of semantic knowledge or memory as well. So that's how we use semantic. That's a, the very first step. We look for what does our character know that we don't know, and that guides our research. Okay? But the next thing we do is called a driving memory or driving belief. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now, and I guess I should give you a little background. Um, so... Every single story that we tell, now we're actors, so we embody experience, we embody behavior. That's our job in the storytelling process, okay? But every story that is told has a theme, right? You guys all familiar with the themes? Okay, so if you're, um, if you're doing a play right now, the first thing I'd like you to do is right now to identify whatever you're working on today. You feel free to work on anything you like. But what is the theme of the thing that you're working on? Just give me, uh, in a couple of you, just say the theme out loud so, so I can just kind of get the idea that we're on a, uh, so is it, who, raise your hand if you know the theme of the, the play that you're currently working on. Okay, so if you don't know it, I'm going to give you an easy way, you just Google it, right? Almost all the classics you'll find immediately themes, and I do that all the time. So uh, feel free to do that, and if, you guys can do that now if you want, okay, cool. or you can choose a theme. So if I were to, maybe, so actually, let me just make sure that I'm using words that make sense. Um, if I ask you what is the point of the story that is being told, does that make better sense to you than theme? To a couple of you? Okay, all right, good. So that's the idea, right? Every, every play, every screenplay has a point. Um, and the reality is story 
is a very natural brain function, and, and we can talk more about that if you like, but we actually think in stories very often. That's one way that we think. We always look for cause and effect. So, so the idea of sitting down at a play, why, 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 do, why do people go to plays? Why do you watch movies? What, what's important about story? To, to, in, let me hear your answers, yeah. Entertainment. Entertainment is the number one answer, and that's a, that's a good one. It's, it's a part of it. Culture. Yeah, culture. What about culture? Uh, like learning about different people's culture. Learning about people's culture. Anybody else? Learning is the key word. That's it. That's really why we go. We go, we watch a movie, and, and there's been lots of studies. If we've, we've studied brain activity in people watching, watching movies, and their brains are going through the same activities as if they were doing the thing that the main character is doing. Because we're learning how to live our lives. So one of the th other things that um, Dr. Margot taught me is that our brains are prediction engines. That that's what they do. They predict the future, right? So we know not to step in front of a moving car because we've learned that. Hopefully not by doing it once, right? Or hopefully not by, but we know because we've been taught don't do that. If we, if we had to, every single time we came to the street, you had to have someone with you to remind you, oh no, that car will kill, right? But memory lets us know don't, don't do that. Or this is the place where you get the good sushi, right? <laughs> so that's why memory is so important. It's a learning mechanism. And so story is this organized series of event that, events that we get to watch unfold in front of us that we can learn from and we don't have to get hit by a car, right? We don't have to get bit by the dog. We don't have to fall off the cliff. <laughs> we can watch James Bond. So, so, that, so, so learning is, a, it really is a learning tool and it's the most natural learning tool and it's existed for um, the dawn of mankind. It's, it, story has existed before language existed, sitting around the fires, you know, sharing with the group which berries will, will kill you and which ponds will have the best fish, right? So think about your job as helping society learn about what might happen to them if they engage in any kind of activity that this story is about. So then you have to ask yourself, what is my story about? So um, if we were talking about, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Lisa, uh, uh, so Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, anybody familiar with that? Yeah, okay, all right, so Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is a, is a story about um, deceit and lies, ultimately. So for the purposes of our exercises today, I need you to decide what is the story point, what is the theme in the play that you're performing and the character that you're creating? So if, you, if I was playing brick in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and I, I would look up what is the theme, and it's deceit and lies, and I'm, okay, so I need you to do that first so we can do the first step. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to come up with a theme. So your story could be about deceit and lies, it could be about um, social inequity, it could be like injustice, it could be about um, you know, feminist rights. What, what, what do you think your stories are about? You can be wrong and it's perfectly okay for the purposes of this exercise, but you just need to choose one, okay? So, go! Yeah, and if you're in a scene together, discuss it. We're all, or most of us are in a play together. <laughs> Is it one play? Uh, yeah, we're doing You're in Town. Perfect. What's the theme of You're in Town? Uh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be more than one, for sure. Yeah. It's like social injustices. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Okay, so let, let's just go with that. Okay, social inequities or social injustices? Which one? Social injustices. Injustices. Okay, okay. So, now, I want you each... So, everybody's character has a belief about social injustice. So... What is your character's belief about social injustice? So what, what is your character's um, belief about it? Okay. Say social injustice is? Social injustice is something that is oppressive, especially to my character. Perfect. Social injustice is impressive. That's your belief as your character. It's your character's belief. Good. Okay. Anyone else? You all have to choose one. So yeah. Can we like talk about the character that we have for the monologue prepared or whatever? Yeah. I, yeah, whatever piece you want to work on. Okay. So what's the what piece are you working on? Well, my character, he's really desperate for approval and he's desperate for uh, affection because he's had a lot of um, hard life experiences. Great. What is the what is the overall play about? What are, what are, what do people learn when they watch so, the 
this um this middle aged man just got divorced through his wife and he lost he lost his kid in a car accident. Mm -hmm. So he's had a really tough life before and now he wants to get a hug from every single person that's walking by in his car. He just wants to And what happens at the end what does he learn at the end of the play? That no one no, okay, so, so, he, so he's desperate for attention, and the wor so the world is a cold place. Okay, now, at the point in the monologue, when, when you're doing a monologue, what is the character's belief about this idea, the world is a cold place? Well, he has hope at the beginning. Perfect, he has hope. But, okay, but when you're doing the monologue, what is, it, what is belief at that point in time? What would he say? He would say, I believe this about the world being a cold place. What do, you, what do you mean by that? I believe the world is a cold place, or I believe the world offers warmth to those who seek it. I believe the world is a cold place, so only a select few people and find one of those people. Oh, okay. All right, that's great. So the world can be a warm place for a select few people. Okay, so that's, that's your character's belief. You guys follow that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so... Choose a belief. Now, I, you, I need to actually choose one or else the next exercise doesn't work, right? So, okay, so you've got yours, you've got yours. Who else needs help choosing a belief? Anybody else? So I'm gonna point to you and I want you to just say it very quickly, what your belief is, okay? So yours again is? Uh, social inequality and it's oppressive to my kids. Perfect. It's acceptable. Okay, social, social injustice is acceptable. Yes. Awesome. Life is unfair unless you're beautiful and rich. Ah, I love it. <laughs> the thing with mine is like love in general, and she's like confused about love. Okay, so what she believe about love? Love is confusing. It could yeah. be okay. Love is confusing. Good. Yours. Like the one you just said, and also like desperation too. I'm I'm really desperate for. So pick one. So pick one belief. It's got to be a belief. Something this guy okay, believes. The, the world is a cruel place for. Um, for most. Yeah. Sorry to sorry to finish your sentence. Let's tell it bad habit. Okay, it's okay. Um, so I want you to just make up a character and you go with uh, social injustice is oppressive, okay? That's your character's belief. We're just going to make one up for you. Uh, not everyone is equal. Okay. Yeah, good. I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking. Can you come back to me? Sure, I sure can. Uh, the rich benefit from an oppressive system. Excellent. Um, social injustice is not oppressive. Okay, good. Not oppressive. Excellent. I also don't really have it. That's okay. We'll come back to you. Good. Um, I'm destined to live above traditional morality. Excellent. Destined to live above traditional morality. That's a good one. Social injustices is allowed and acceptable. Great. Social injustices are hurting most, but then there are a few who are excused from pain. Okay, can you make one sort of one sentence that, that characterizes your character's belief about? Yeah. Um, and, and you can put a va it also helps to put a value in it. So does your character believe social injustice is good or bad? Bad. Bad, okay. So social injustice is bad, and if you want to say why, you could. Okay, uh, just social injustice is not fair. Good, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful, yeah. Uh, social injustice is normal. Is normal. Great. Um, I'm doing a monologue from All My Sons, and my character believes that the American dream is dead. Excellent. You get it. Good. Um, in my monologue, my character believes that people are blind to what's going on in the world around them. Excellent. Another good one. Okay, great. Now, your characters have those beliefs because of what this gentleman said earlier, and that is an episode in their lives. Something happened in their past that made them have that belief. And in fact, probably several things, because after the first time they decided to have that belief, they found other things that supported their, their belief. This is how we determine our driving belief. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use an imaginative exercise to literally create a memory for your character. Okay? So I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to float above the scene in which your character made the decision to have the belief they have. All right, good. And then come back to now. Okay, good. So 
the movement thing sometimes works well it works really well for a lot of people and then other people not so much so it doesn't matter you're all individuals you all have your individual experience but how many people are able to have some sort of physiological experience of that event okay great awesome now uh, how many people felt like you you had an informed movement like maybe the, that's the way the character moves how many people felt like yeah, it might add something like that a couple of you okay oh, quite a few actually about half that's great that's awesome so that's kind of an interesting thing because it does actually mirror how we form our beliefs and those beliefs determine our behavior and they're directly the result of our past experiences those episodic memories so the four memories we're going to create are one the driving the driving belief the memory that determines how the character's world view is displayed right and I like to do that first because even before you memorize your lines in the very beginning I like to look for the differences in meanings like we talked about the semantic memories and then I like to do, do the driving memory because now you've created this mental framework through which the character views the world and when you read the script you can get a much better understanding of how the character views the world from the very beginning and you'll be amazed if you do this on your own how much more information you get viscerally like the, what you'll experience in your body and how much more you'll understand the, the, the richness of the situations if you start with the character's worldview way before you memorize your lines okay so that's one okay so any questions or comments about creating a driving belief okay awesome so the next thing we're gonna do is Can we're gonna create yeah, yes please yeah uh, I know a, a famous actress uh, who also has a very good memory excellent memory and I said does the excellent memory help you learn your lines and she said well that's that's an irrelevant question uh, first I have to understand the character and then the lines take care of themselves yep Anyway, it fits in. Exactly no, it fits perfectly. Saying. It's exactly right. It, um, um, what, what she's saying yeah. is, once she understands and develops the character, mm -hmm. then she knows what the character is going to say, and the lines become easy. If cool. it work the other way, you memorize the lines, and they don't make any sense, but you memorize them, and then you try to base a character on those is the wrong way to do it. That's right. Yeah. So, so there's a, another famous study, right, where in, they said, what percentage of communication are the words that we use? Any guesses? What percentage of, the communi of communication, right, of 100% of me communicating to you, how important are the words? What percentage? Yeah? Uh, 16%. Good guess. Very good guess. Yeah? 27. 27, a good guess. 7. 7%. 7 that's it. 58% of any given communication is physiological, so gestural. Then 38 is tonal, the way we say, what we say, right? And then only 7% are the actual words that we choose. So as actors, right, all we get is that little 7% in a script. But Dr. McGaugh is 100% correct, and so is that professional actress, in that you start with understanding the character, and now the words make a lot more sense to you even in the developmental process. I'll also add that Fiona Shaw, who's another professional actor, she answered the question, well, how do you, how do you, you know, everybody always asks us, right? Everybody here has been asked, how do you memorize all those lines, right? And her answer is, um, well, I don't memorize the lines. I, l I learn the situation in which those lines are inevitable. I learn the situation in which those are the only words that I could speak. I love that idea, right? So start with character by understanding worldview, then understand situation. And the way to understand, yes sir? I can add also mm -hmm. to that, it's also the only movement that you can make. That is, how do you, how do you know that you're gonna move across the stage that way? Oh. Understanding the character and the situation determines what movement is. So you don't say, oh, at this point, I walk across the room and pick up the lamp. No, it's not that. The situation is such that that's the only thing that is appropriate to do. And you don't have to memorize that, it just it, it evolves from the situation. That's great acting. Yeah. That's when the great acting happens. Okay, so now, 
We know we've got a driving memory that creates a worldview. That's the first memory, but we have three more. The next three memories are based on what I call the primary elements of drama. Have you guys ever done any improv before? Yes. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to make that the improv space. Let me get two volunteers. Okay, jump up. Yay! We're just going to do. We're going to do some short. We're going to do some short ones. Okay, so. Um, somebody give me a, uh, uh, pl an environment. Yep. Restaurant. Restaurant. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready, begin, uh, your improv scene in a restaurant. Um, excuse me, sir? Uh, yeah. Um, my water is lukewarm. I asked for <laughs> ice cold. <laughs> okay, um, I can get you a fresh one if you want. Yes, please. That would be perfect. <laughs> Um, can you go a little faster? <laughs> Stop. Okay. Now, we already have a scene. So in that very short period of time, these two uh, very ex excellent improvers gave us everything we needed to make sense of that scene. Do you anyone want to, want to make guesses about what those things might be? There's, there's three. Yes. Relationship? <laughs> Boom! Yes. Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad you said objective. Thank you for saying that. Please remember that. But that's not one of them. Yes. So character is, is right around there. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, what about the what about the character? Like who they are as a person, like how he's a leader and she's like the customer. So that's great, and that's that's good, and that's relationship. So yeah, yeah. What what what? Conflict. Conflict. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna restate it a little bit, and that is the emotional state. In a given moment. So immediately, we knew where they were. They knew the environment. We knew the relationship. We had run it, and we knew that she was already miffed with him for being too slow, right? Okay, thank you guys. That was awesome. <laughs> had we not known any one of those three things, would that scene have made of much sense? No. <laughs> In order for the audience to make meaning, those are the only three things you have to provide. So a story, if you ever become writers, which you all should, because you're actors, you should be writers as well. Um, if you've ever become writers, all you have to do is make sure that you include, in order for the audience to make sense of the, any given scene, the environment, the relationship, and the emotional state of the individual at the beginning of the scene, because you know it's going to move, right? So that's what we need for the audience to make meaning. And there's a lot of ways now that we can explore our scenes by first identifying those three elements of drama and then secondarily providing the memories that drive the character's behavior in each scene as a result of those three primary elements of drama. Does that make sense? So we're going to know what the character's worldview is. We're going to know how the character feels about where they are. We're going to, and we're going to create a memory so you can embody that. We're then going to create a memory so that we know how the, how the character feels about the relationship that they're in in your scene or monologue. And then we're going to create a memory so that the character's first moment on stage is that you're embodying a decisive emotional state or mood at the very top of the scene. If you create those four memories, you have provided your central nervous system, <laughs> your body and your brain, with all the information it needs to bring a role to life. Now you have to do a lot of research as well. There's other details to fill in like Dr. McGaw said earlier. There's lots of details that you have to do during the research. But you can guide your research again by asking yourself, what does my character know that I don't know? What are the semantic memories? And then what are the differences in meanings, what we call associations, right? So, so I'd like to now go ahead and create the three memories and then let's, and just for fun, this is, this is not a performance, this is an exploration. I want to see how you guys feel like it affects your monologues or scenes. Okay? So, um, how many people are doing a, 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 raise your hand if you're doing a scene with somebody else, if you're working on a scene with somebody else. Oh, okay, that's great. That makes it easier. Okay, everybody, so everybody's working by themselves, doing their own monologue or whatever. So, f because we have, um, um, uh, well, so let's just work on today, like the first three or four lines. Pick like a comfortable 
endpoint, right, to, to explore. But let's start now, okay? So this is what we're gonna do. Now, for this, we're gonna create the memories. We're gonna go through the same, um, the same thing that we did earlier. Um, so you, if you wanna like lay on the floor, I don't care. You can do whatever you want, get comfortable. You can stay in your seats. You can move to another space. I'm just gonna guide you through three more memories and then we're gonna allow, uh, then we're gonna see each one of you work a little bit and then we'll play a little bit. Um, Dr. McGaugh and I will play a little bit with what we see and, uh, and we'll see what we can explore, what you guys can learn, okay? All right, great. So uh, first place, the environment. Where does your scene take place? The one that you're currently developing. Everybody knows where it takes place? Okay, float above the scene, looking down upon yourself as the character in that space. We're going to map the environment, which is very important for your brain. We're going to create imaginary reality for you to live in. And then when you're ready, go ahead and come back to now. Okay, uh, give me three details of your space, your environment. Three. Yep. I'm like in the forest, and there's like a dirt path. Great. And then there's grass on the sides, and there's a spot of man sitting. Perfect. Okay, you've got that all in your mind. Yeah. Good. Okay, give me three details of your space. Um, there's a mirror in front of me. Oh, nice. I have a basin that I'm trying to wash my hands in, and it's very, very dark and very uncertain. Excellent. Give me three details of your space. And then, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I'm standing at someone's doorstep, and they are standing in front of me, and the door is like hanging off its hinges. Excellent. Very good. Now, everybody pick one. Pick one aspect of it. it can be yeah, yes. What if yours is breaking the fourth wall? Yeah, that's in right now. That's perfect. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Did you ever hear that? What if you're breaking the fourth wall? That's okay. What we're doing is we're creating this imaginary environment for our character to be able to interact in, right? So, excellent question. Um, so I want everybody, just do me a favor, pick one thing in that imaginary space and just focus your attention on it. And it can be a sound, it can be a, a, a sight, it can be... Notice if you have any at all, however slight, or maybe not so slight, any physiological response to that. Do you feel that somewhere in your body, anywhere in your body? If you do, just notice where you might. Does your breathing change as a result of focusing on that one thing? Notice your breath now. Are you holding it or breathing in and out, breathing in through your nose or out through your mouth, or both, the opposite? So the reason I want to bring that up, very good, and then come back to now. How many people felt something somewhere? Yeah, great, awesome. So as actors, that's an awesome skill to have. It's responsivity, right? We have the ability to, use, to control our mind, to direct our focus, to choose where we place our attention, and it affects our body. And that can be your biggest friend as an actor, identifying the attention of your character. And so now that you've created this imaginary environment, everybody think of the first line, your first line in this scene that you're about to do. And answer this question, why do you say that line? And answer it like this, from this perspective. Do you say that line because of something you see, hear, feel, or say to yourself in that imaginary environment? Yes. Can there be multiple? Yep, sure. But pick, pick, the, pick the first one that... Because it, uh, that's it. Ulti ultimately, is always multiple, right? We're always seeing here, right? But so, but yes, it can be whatever you want. It's, and now we're going to come back to that later. But the reason I wanted to bring it up now is because very often that's the best way to start your scene: is to imagine the environment, connect to a stimulus in the imaginary world, and allow that first piece of dialogue to be motivated as as a response to something in the environment, right? Does everybody want to try it? Actually, let's try it. So go ahead and just by yourself, be in your own world. Go ahead and connect to it. Remember your first line. When I, when I count to three, actually, no. I, I'm going to, so whenever you're ready on your own cue, when you feel fully connected to that stimulus, go ahead and say that, allow that first line to, to uh, be motivated by that stimulus. Whenever you're ready.
Go ahead and speak it out loud. On the count of three, one, two, three, connect. Good. Reconnect again. Double your connection. Notice what details you can notice in this first moment. This thing that you see, hear, feel, or say to yourself. And then notice how it makes you feel. And then on, the, on three, two, one, I want you to spit, say your line as a result of that. Notice how you feel as a result of this thing you're focused on. Three, two, one. Good, awesome. Come back to now. Uh, how did that feel? Yeah, good. Anybody else? And, and it's okay if it doesn't. It is what it is. Okay. How would you describe working from that manner? Yes? I think it kind of sets you up for success because we always talk about a moment before, mm -hmm. especially when we're doing a monologue. Right. And our first words and our first sentence obviously have to have a purpose yeah. in which you're going to develop something. Mm -hmm. So this kind of helps you get in that mindset of that situation and what your purpose is and why you're saying those words. And it kind of, since you don't have like a literal scene that you're in at the time, it mm -hmm. like helps you create that. Love it. Um, an issue that I've had with this monologue particularly is that um, in the past I've found that like I start the monologue just by saying the first couple words and I find my like emotional catch up is like a, a few moments into the right. actual monologue and this helps to like you're in the place before you begin speaking rather than you begin speaking before you're in the place. Excellent. Yeah, and, and that's how it really happens, right? I mean, yeah, not, yeah. Yeah, you can both go, yeah. <laughs> So like it's kind of a given, but it definitely gives you more perspective and insight into your character, and I feel like that definitely helps throughout the entire thing. Great. I felt like the level of intensity in my monologue always took a second to get to where it needed to be because I, I wasn't thinking about how the previous scene in the play was already like very highly intensive. Nice. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to use that as a segue to do, do our next memory because the next memory is the most sort of correlative, if you will, most similar to um, the moment before work that, is, that we very often do, and that is the mood. So once again, we're going to go back to an episodic event. What happened in order for your character be, to be in the mood that they are in at the beginning of your scene? So first, what, is, what mood is your character in at the beginning of the scene? Raise your hand if you need more time. Good, you, you, okay, take a minute. What mood is your character in at the beginning of your scene or your monologue? Got it, great, awesome. Now, what happened? Now, keep in mind, this, is a, this could have happened literally immediately before, the moment before, right? Or it could have happened the, a day ago because it might be that you're coming in to see somebody for the first time you haven't seen in a few days, right? I, right? I, that's why I don't know what your scene is, but. It might be the fact that you're coming in to see your mom and you haven't seen your mom in a year and you're, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what do I say to this woman who gave me birth and I haven't seen her in a year, right? So what is it, what, you know how you feel and then take a minute to, to answer the question, why does your character, why do you as your character feel that way in the very beginning? What happened before this scene? Could have been 20 years ago or two seconds ago that makes your character feel the way they feel at the top of the scene. Just so I can get an idea, um, uh, what, what, what event have you chosen? What happened to you make your character feel that way? So I got removed from my daughter, okay. and um, after I gave birth, I was sworn to secrecy about it, so I have a lot of built-up anger and tension about that. Yeah, okay, and yeah. hatred for my ex. Awesome, great, that's wonderful. So. She was removed, her daughter was removed from her. That, that's, that's a pretty powerful mood motivator, okay? What, what, about, uh, what about you? Um, I uh, was working at my father's company, and it turns out that the car parts we were making were faulty and responsible for a lot of deaths. Excellent. That's right, yeah, very good. Okay, so, and I want you to think, um, in t for, for that, for that um, memory, I want you to think about the, the, the specific time that, right? The specific time. So you could choose the time when you found, the very moment when you found out. So how did you find out, right? What happened specifically? That's the memory you want to create. You know, 
the time your daughter was removed from you, when did that impact you? Was it the moment you came home and the daughter wasn't there, or was it the first Christmas without her? Right? So you choose an event that is meaningful to you as the character. All right? So does everybody have an event? Anybody want more time? You have an event? Yeah? Okay, float above, go ahead and float above. We're going to create that event. Okay, thoughts, comments? Yeah? I feel, I feel, I feel a lot more than my character. Excellent, yeah. The, good, that's the purpose, yeah. Um, the moment hit really close to home, so I was able to feel like genuine, like genuinely in the situation of my character. Excellent, excellent. It's much more intense. Yeah, good. Yeah, like adding on to what he said, like I could like relate to what the character went through, so right. it's like more real to me, I guess. Very good, very good. Yeah, great. Yeah. This is how our brains work naturally. We think in past experiences, right? Okay, so we're going to do one more. Uh, and what is the last one? I forget. Relationship. Okay, now, uh, is anybody in a scene by themselves? Okay, no worries. You use your relationship to yourself in that moment. How do you feel about yourself? Yes? Mine has a dead person. Awesome. So you, you get to be, you get artistic license, and you can choose... No, this is really, honestly, you, you know, you guys, I'm teaching you, that, right, this very repetitive sort of idea of how to create a memory, but the beauty is you are, your creativity, nobody's going to create that memory the way you create that memory. And nobody's going to perform the role the way you perform the role as a result of the memories you create for this character. So you can choose which relationship is more important in this scene. Is it the relationship to the, to the dead body? Or is it the relationship to yourself in this moment, right, during this scene? And if you're ultimately, you're going to have to create, let's say you're doing a, if you're doing, I'll ask you, if you're doing a Thanksgiving scene, and I said, okay, create relationship memories, uh, what would you do? Yes? Yeah, for sure you'd use some of your own experiences. How many, let's say there was a father, a son, and a mother, and you're the sister. How many, how many memories would you create? Yeah, three. Yeah, yeah you create a relationship for every significant person you had to interact with. Do you treat different people differently? So I could say, do you treat your mother differently than your best friend? And of course that's a yes, but do you even treat two of your good friends differently? Yeah. And why do you treat them differently? Because of what? And, and what, how, how do you learn to relate with each individual differently in, the, in each relationship? Personality types? Um, personality types will certainly attract each other, but yeah. Like how do you have different shared experiences with each of them? Boom! Past experience! It always comes back to it. This is what I'm telling you, this guy changed my world. If you look at life through the, through the lens of your everything is affected by past experiences and shared experiences is, is a great word, a great descriptive word for your friends, right? What past, what shared experiences do you have? That's why you treat your friends differently, yes. So if the monologue's just with yourself, would it be past experiences with yourself? Yeah, yeah. And especially in relation to what the monologue is about. Right. For sure. Yes? What if in your monologue you're talking about someone else but they're not there? Would that be them? What would you do? What do you think? What do you think would work best then for you to, if you're talking to somebody else, you know, you're, you're imagining this conversation with this other person, and I am, the, as the audience, I'm watching you to get meaning about what this, this situation means to you as an individual through your character's perspective. What would you, how would you create that monologue? In terms of what memories would you create for that monologue? For mine specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah um, I probably think about things, like a memory by myself that okay. kind of like impacted our relationship in the future, like why I ended up in that place with that guy, with 
this mindset? Okay. No, no, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're, is it a romantic relationship type thing? Yeah, and so you, why did I choose this guy? What, what happened in my past to make me choose this guy? That's, first of all, you'll be happy and healthy the rest of your life if you apply that to your everyday lives. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a great way to think about your character. For sure, you know, what, you know, why did I end up with this guy? Oh, was that time that I... I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm staying away from relationship topics in the <laughs> high school class, forget about it. Um, okay, so, okay, great, awesome. So let's do our last one. And our last one is our relationship. So you can only do one because that's all we have time for right now. So pick the most important relationship in your senior monologue. Float above the time the, when the event occurred that defines this relationship that you have with this person in your monologue. I should give you a minute to think of an event. Everybody have an event? Okay, great. So what happened that defines your relationship? Go ahead and float above that. Go ahead and look down upon that scene from above. Great. Very good. Okay, thoughts? Thoughts? Comments? On relation? I saw you nodding your head earlier. Did you get a good solid experience? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest, I, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, even, even at the professional level, I think it's really interesting that I'll see even professional actors kind of treat everybody the same on stage. And we don't do that in real life. So this, this exercise provides a level of realism, I believe, that could really set you apart as an actor moving forward. Even, I mean, no matter what level of acting you choose to do just in your next production. But, how interesting to treat each person differently as we do in real life. Can I interject something here? Please. Every, everything that you've just done, everything I've just learned, applies to getting started. It's all to getting started. Now consider the problem you have when you're in a long run, let's say uh, on Broadway, and you can be there for a year and a half. And the question is, what do you do for that? Does it just become automatic and boring and ritualized? Well, the best actors say that they do this for every scene in every play. They make it, they make it new. They just not recite the lines and go through it and look at their watches and say, how many more minutes before this play is over tonight? <laughs> but they, they create some novelty in it so that they try to imagine that what is about to happen is going to happen for the first time. And they build that into their thinking as well. So that's part of memory also, is to look at a situation and view it as a new experience, even though you've had a lot of them before. But that's what life is like, isn't it? You've had a lot of experiences. You've been in this room before, most of you have been, or you've been in a classroom here, and you know what to expect. But something different happened today. And, and, and acting in the long run, you've got to create novelty, for each of the scenes you're in for day after day. It can't be just a, a ritual running off of the, of the mouth. 100% agreed. And working in this way gives you the ability to now tap into a number of stimulus. So I'm really glad that you said that this is, what, this is our preparation, right? This is all before we start rehearsals. This is all the stuff that we need to have in us before we start rehearsals, right? Now, rehearsals gives you a chance to repetitively do it again and again and again and explore different options. And maybe because now you have created this environment and you know the dead body is here, right? You can respond to the dead body on one time and see, you know, uh, whatever. You can see a, a something for the first time like, oh, they left their watch on, <laughs> right? Oh, I never noticed that before. But you're create, but you're responding to stimulus. I like the word stimulus. I hope you can accept it as actors. Um, but you're responding to stimulus from within this imaginary circumstance. Your attention, your focus, your li life, your your process of living is in the imaginary circumstances. If you've created them in a way that fully allows you to then respond to different things and performances over time, but that are all within the imaginary circumstances, the world of the character. So it's a, it's a really great way to be able to do, um, I hope you all get year and a half runs on Broadway. 
And it's a great way to be able to do those runs and keep them fresh, not only for, your, for the audience, but for yourself. <laughs> so that's an excellent point. OK, audience, so I would love to see now, let's just see, totally as an exploration, um, let's make this our performance space again. Everybody come up and do just your first few lines, OK? But I'm going to kind of coach you through it. And then, um, Dr. McGough, you see anything that you know, is of interest to you um, in terms of you know, well, anything at all. You can, we'll, we'll just kind of watch and then remember. So we're just going to go in a row, OK? So go ahead and put, you can put a chair up there or stand, whatever you need. Can it, can it be like any series of lines that are? Yeah, yeah, I don't care what you do, yeah. OK, so this is what we're going to do. And you can kind of prepare this in your seat now. This is what we'll do so we, can, so we go kind of quick. We're only going to do two or three lines, OK? So um, when I click is when the scene begins, OK, for each one of you, OK? So right now, uh, prepare by imagining the space. OK, remember the thing that defines the relationship, the thing that you, the cue. I'm going to call it the cue. So the thing that you see, hear, feel, or say to yourself is your cue to recall that memory, OK? OK, so remember the cue for your, your uh, relationship. Remember the cue for your driving belief. Good, that's right, good. Now, remember what happened in the moment before to make you feel this way. And then when you're ready, connect to whatever it is in that scene that makes you say your first line. Oh no, it's, it's just a daydream of mine. A little development I dream of, just off the interstate. Not fancy like Levittown. Just a little place. And so we did far, far from Urban Skid Row. Nice. Good, 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 good. Awesome. OK, what was the first thing you were responding to? Um, people, somebody said something to me. What did they say? Uh, they said, uh, what is it, an emergency room? OK, great. Awesome. Ready? So get in that first moment again. What is an emergency room? Hear the tone of the voice when they ask you that question. And then whenever you're ready, on your own, without my click, go ahead and respond to, what is it, an emergency room? Oh, no. It's just a daydream of mine. Nice. She actually connected to that person that time? That was good. Nice. Next. Good. A lot of character work involved there, right? Yeah. OK, so go ahead and put yourself in the space. Remember the cue for your, your mood? Remember the cue for your relationship? And then whenever you're ready, go ahead and connect to that first thing that makes you say the first line. Something you see, hear, feel, or say to yourself in that moment. Whenever you're ready, then. Get your head out of the clouds, Bobby Strong. No one gets in here for free. Every morning you all come here, and every morning some of you got reasons why you ain't gonna pay. And I'm here to tell you, you ain't gonna pay! <laughs> wow. <laughs> what was the very first thing you connected to? Um, Bobby, my scene partner, was just, just walking around aimlessly, just talking about things that were irrational, things that I could not. Do me a favor, get back to that first moment and just watch him. I want to see you watch him walk around. Ready? Put yourself in the scene. Watch him walk around. You can't say anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then whenever you're ready, go to text. Get your head out of the clouds, Bobby Strong. No one gets in here for free. <laughs> one more time. Connect him walking around. Get your head out of the clouds, Bobby Strong. No one gets in here for free. OK, one more time. See him walking around. See him facing the other way and not paying attention to you. Okay. So now the first line is what? To make him get his attention, right? Yeah, see, I love this first moment. Just allow it to come out any way it does to get his attention. No one gets in here for free. OK, did anybody see anything different there? She like came out with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? That was good. Thank nice. You. Yeah, nice. OK, next. It's really about really connecting to the imaginary circumstances and then allowing those memories to affect you in some way. Not all the memories are going to affect every moment, right? OK. OK, put yourself in the space. Think about the relationship. Think about the mood at the very beginning of the space. Good. And whenever you're ready. How happy 
be some. Or some other some could be. Through Athens, I'm thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. For he will not know what but what he do know. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. And love is sometimes said to be a child, because in love he is so oft beguiled as waggish boys and games themselves for swearing. So the boy love is perjured. Nice. Everywhere. Yeah, good, nice. Into the nose, out to the mouth. Okay, good. I'm just going to do something for fun, okay? This is a little bit different than what we've done. Your first moment, can you do me a favor? Connect to that first thing, breathe in through your nose, breathe all the way out through your mouth. So go and go to the very bottom of your breath and eat, let out all your breath and then start from there. See what happens, just for fun. I just want the first two lines. Okay, so put yourself in the space and then we're going to use this artificial exploration just for fun. I'll explain it in a minute. When you're fully connected in through your nose, let the mouth, just let the air fall out of your mouth all the way to the very bottom until you think you have no air left, and then go to text. I'm happy, son. Nice. One more time, but don't breathe in. So, don't breathe in. yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> let, all, let all the air out, go all the way to the bottom, and speak from there. Some, or some other some can be. How'd that feel? It felt like when I was breathing out, I was breathing out Phoebe, and I was breathing in Helena. Oh, nice. Excellent. Well, nice work. Nice work. So I, we can talk about that later. I want to keep going. <laughs> Put yourself in the space. Consider the relationship and what just happened in order to put you in the mood you're in at the beginning of the scene. Go ahead and connect to the very first thing that you see or feel or say in the scene whenever you're ready. Think not I love him though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well. But what care I for yet? <laughs> Once too well with he who speaks pleases those that hear. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's a funny monologue. Okay, uh, good. Uh, what's the first thing you connected to? Uh, he's like, you like him, and I'm like, no. Yeah, okay, good. So give, so give me that first moment. Give me that first moment. You ready? Go ahead and connect back to the space. You like him. Really see it. Open your eyes and see him telling you you like him. Yeah, just hold on. Not yet. Yeah, okay. Whenever you're ready. Think not. Okay, okay, good. So, interesting, right? You've got this great first moment. And then you went out of it and came back into it to respond. So uh, how am I going to do this for you? Okay, so go into the first moment again. Open? Yeah, eyes open, yeah. See, so see the guy. Hear him say, he like him. Just let, it, just let it fall on you, yeah. Hear it. Okay, yeah, whenever you're ready. Think not I love <laughs> yeah. him. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, did you guys see a difference? See, the difference is it's coming out of something that's really happening in the imaginary circumstance, not it's time to speak the line, right? I mean, it's really hard. I still do it. Everybody does it. It's really hard, but that was really good. Yeah, nice. Okay, great. You're literally telling your brain this is a new reality. We are no longer in this room. We are now in this new place. Yeah, good. Put yourself in the space. Remember the relationship. What happened to put you in the mood you're in? You don't know anything about me. Maybe my kid died in a car accident and I haven't felt a child since and now I just want to. You don't know me. Nice, good, okay, good. Connect to it again. Now I want you to relax and just, and I just want you to talk. You, your very first line, you don't know me, I want you to do the same thing that I asked Phoebe to do, which is breathe in through your nose, 
Breathe all the way out, all the way to the bottom where you have no breath, and then see this person, whatever it is that you're responding to, and tell him you don't, he, doesn't, you don't know, he doesn't know you. You don't know me. Good, one more time. Good, that's, that's better, yeah. Nice, relax. I don't want you to listen to yourself. I want you to look at the other person. All the way to the bottom. You don't know me. Good, now, now forget that cadence for a minute. It's good, right? But connect to the other person. Uh, do me a favor, stand up. Is it a guy or a girl you're talking to? Well, I'm talking to a group of people kind of thinking about girl. See, that's me. You're talking to a group of people? Oh, good. Then face the audience. Face the audience. Take them all in and really tell them that they don't know you in this situation. Breathe into the nose, breathe all the way out through the mouth. You don't know me. Yeah, okay, good. One more time, and don't breathe in before you do it. So, so right? yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. That's great. It's fun. We're doing very unnatural things. Just to explore what it feels like. Into the nose, out to the mouth, all the way to the bottom. You don't know me. Yeah. How'd that feel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. You guys see a difference? Yeah, that's good. That's nice. Really next, I'm so proud of you guys for choosing these difficult monologues with lots of emotional power. That's great. So put yourself in the place. You've got to remember the relationship. Remember what happened to put you in the mood you're in at the beginning of the scene. And then connect to that first thing. Whenever you're ready, you can go to go to death. I always have this fascination, people's obsession with love. I think it stems from the reality of truly knowing that we're alone. I wanted to expand further on my findings and how they, for lack of a better word, change us. Nice, nice. What did you, what did you guys think about that first moment? That was great. Yeah, you really had it before you even came in. It was good. Nicely done. Good job. Next. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I want to see more, but we only, you know. <laughs> how, how many people have a st uh, to go still, just so I have an idea? Is it just a front row going today? Okay, all right, awesome. Yet there is a spot. Out, damn spot, out, I say! One. Two. I think it's time to do it. Hell is murky. Bye, my love. Bye. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. Good. What's your first, your first moment? What's the first thing you notice in that scene? My hand. The hand. Yeah, okay, great. Awesome, awesome. Uh, you want to do that one more time? Okay, awesome. So take a, we'll take on one second. And we'll, but go ahead, and, right now, go ahead and, in your mind, think about where you are. Think about the relationship with whoever else is in the scene. Think about what happened in that moment before. And then take a moment to really see the blood on your hands whenever you're ready. And don't go to text right away. Whenever you're ready, notice the blood on your hands, but wait for my click to go to text. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was a spot. Good, good, good. One more time. Here's so, so something interesting, we, we all do this with our breath, right? When we, when we go to speak, we, 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 we take a breath or sometimes we'll see what happens if as soon as I click, no matter where you are in your breathing process, inhaling or exhaling, that you go right to text, okay? We don't need to prepare to say words. When we're speaking, we never, we never do, right? Like in real life, we don't prepare to do it. 
So that breath is this idea that we get used to as actors of preparing the sail lines. OK, good. That's great. I like your work. Go ahead and notice the spot again. Put yourself in the space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, get it out if you can. Yet here's a spot. Out, damn spot, out, I say. All right, OK. Yeah, how does that feel? More natural. Okay, yeah. Yeah, nice. Okay, awesome. All right, nicely done, guys. And we're right, oh, yeah, perfect. We're still right on time. <laughs> Go ahead and put yourself in the space. Go ahead and think about the relationship in the space that you're about to engage in. What happened right before to put yourself in the mood. And when that, whenever you're ready. Because they weren't just men. For instance, one time it had been raining several days and this kid came up to me. Gave me his last pair of dry socks. Nice. Good, good, good. Yeah, one more time from the beginning. Ready? Good and connect to that first thing. What is the first thing you're noticing? My brother. Excellent. So you're talking to your brother? Okay. Put yourself in the scene. Now, when you're ready, I want you to open your eyes and look at your brother. Connect to your brother. When you're ready, don't go to text until you hear my click. Yeah, connect to him. That, good. Yeah, hear him, see him. And no breath right from there. Because they weren't just men. For instance, one time it had been, it had been raining yeah, several yeah, days. Yeah, okay, good. But you feel that? What did you guys see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's great, right? It's good. It's, it's, there's nuance to the behavior. I see him connecting to what's happening. We see these micro expressions come across the face. Nice work. Okay, so awesome. We have two minutes. And so what I like to do is say, what are your learnings? Now, the reason I like to do this is because um, it's actually not for us. Um, it's actually for you. But I need you to do this in a specific format. So. Um, what is the one thing, I want you to say this to yourself, what is the one thing that jumps out right now as being something that was very impactful to you that you learned in, in the last hour and a half? What's the one thing today that pops in your mind and I say, what did you learn today? Well, the one thing that really affected me, the one thing I took away from this class could be something you saw somebody else do, something you did, something you heard, doesn't matter. Raise your hand if you need more time to have that thing. Okay, somebody, I just have to have it. Uh, uh, so what is your thing? Um, my thing is that you can always create new emotions, new movements, new situations. Even if you are playing a character over and over again, always find a new thing to do. Don't make awesome. it redundant. Oh, I love it. Great. You can always find new things to do within... I don't, so um, I, this, is, this is the time I have to use your words. So you can always make, find new things to do. Don't be redundant. Okay, now, so you all have your thing. Now I'm going to let you ask yourself this next question. You're going to answer it loud just so we can keep you on track. Um, what, um, uh, how are you going to implement that for the next time you perform? I, the next time I perform. The next time I perform, I'm going to put myself in the situation that I'm faced with, but then I'm going to pay attention to the little things within the scene to see how they change perfect. and how that affects me. And how to fit perfect. What a great learning. Let me just get one or two more. So the next time I perform, yeah. Oh. Or, or the next time I rehearse, whatever it is. Well, something that I learned today is like treating each like person on stage with you differently. Okay, great. So how are you going to implement that for the next role you create? Like really focus on... Say the next role I create. The next role I create, I'll really focus on individual relationships. Love it. Okay, awesome. Okay, I think that's it, right? Yes, can we thank our wonderful, wonderful thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. That was awesome. And especially thank you, Dr. McGough, for everything you've taught me and us. Yeah. Thank you.